welcome. Thank you so much for joining the World Affairs Council of Connecticut today to discuss the coup in Myanmar and global threats to democracy with Ambassador Derek Mitchell. Uh, Ambassador Derek Mitchell is the president of the National Democratic Institute. He served as the US ambassador to Myanmar from 2012 to 2016, uh, America's first ambassador to the country in 22 years. Uh, ambassador Mitchell, welcome. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you so much for having me, really grateful. We're so glad you're here with us. My name is Amanda Jolly, VP of Programs with the Council, and today's structure will kick off with a conversation with Ambassador Derek Mitchell and Megan Torrey, CEO of the World Affairs Council of Connecticut. Today's episode of State of the World is sponsored by Yukon Global, and we are so grateful to have their support. Uh, they make conversations like this possible, uh, and we thank them for supporting the work of the World Affairs Council and for making urgent community conversations around global issues possible. So today we are honored to have Ambassador Mitchell here with us to discuss the coup in Myanmar, what caused it, what happens next, and what this might mean for the security of the region and for the health of democracy around the world. Uh, so let's get started. I'm pleased to turn it over to you, Megan. Megan Torrey, CEO of the World Affairs Council. Thank you so much, Amanda, and thank you everyone joining us from here in Connecticut, around the country and around the globe. Um, we are so lucky to have the uh, Ambassador Mitchell, the president of NDI with us here today. Welcome Ambassador Mitchell. Thank you, Megan. Thanks so much. Before we get started, I just want to give a shout out to um, someone we have in common. One of your senior advisors is the chairman of our board. So Peter Kelly, thank you so much for um, your leadership here. Um, we're very grateful to you. We have a lot to talk about today, so um, let's dive right in. We know that in early February, there was a military coup in Myanmar. Its democratically elected officials, including Aung San Suu Kyi, have been jailed. There have been ensuing protests um, against the coup. The military has responded with an increased use of force. And we've also read um, extensively about internet blackouts. So Ambassador Mitchell, can you sort of set the stage for us? How did we get here? Um, what's going on today? Right. Well, first of all, again, thank you to the World Affairs Council in my home state of Connecticut. So it's always a pleasure when I got the invitation, I leapt at it because anything <laughs> that's Connecticut related, I will do. It, it is a tragedy what's going on in Myanmar, otherwise known as Burma, as you all know. Um, there is a history of, of military involvement in politics, of military dictatorship. They took over in 1962 after a decade of, uh, or so of democracy and uh, took in, stayed in power for half a century, for 50 years, essentially. You can say even 55 years. It really was only in 2015 that there was a transition of power to a duly elected government under Aung San Suu Kyi. So the, we always knew, we had no illusions, even in the past 10 years when we saw this transition to a quasi-democratic government, that the military was hovering behind the scenes and that if they felt like their prerogatives were not being defended, that they always felt like they could jump in. Uh, it still was a bit of a surprise. It would happen this soon that they they did this under the pretext of an election of election fraud, uh, which there were you know the election wasn't perfect, but no one, even the military, hasn't even suggested that the results did not reflect the will of the people. But they clearly had other reasons uh, to jump in, and and one of them is that they feel. Maybe they felt disrespected. They felt that they had this democracy controlled and Aung San Suu Kyi and the NLD, her party were sort of outmaneuvering them. Uh, we're not exactly sure why uh, they did what they did, but clearly what they're doing is brutal and it's uh, very depressing. It's a huge setback for the country. Um, and, and we're hopeful that, but uh, not terribly optimistic they can recalculate and, and pull back from the brink. So historically, we know that the military has played a very big role um, in in uh, Myanmar and Burma. Uh, do you think that uh, the, the military will give up and facilitate democratic elections as stated um, in one year? Or do reports that we heard um, coming out yesterday that the military has hired a lobbyist to lobby US officials um, and officials in other countries, does that point to a longer term strategy? I think it is a longer term strategy, and it also gets to the term or the definition of the term democracy. I mean, there are a lot of places around the world that say we are a democracy or return to democracy, and then it's their version of democracy. It's a highly controlled, it's a highly constrained democracy that truly doesn't, it doesn't conform to what we would define as a, a, a government that reflects the will of the people through regular elections. 
So I, I personally think, and there's more indications, the military is not going to give up power uh, in a year. Even if they do, quote, give up power, it could be the way they did this in the past. They create a new constitution or amend a constitution so that the democracy is constrained and that the one who is going to win that election, in quotes, is the former military you know, person who just takes off the uniform and takes control. So is that the military getting out of politics only because they take off the uniforms and have a civilian face? Is it true democracy? No, I think the good money is on not the democracy that we had hoped for that we saw budding in 2015, where Aung San Suu Kyi and any real democracy, her party or whatever represents her is likely to win. I don't think they will ever allow that again. And that's, that's where we have to, you know, we, we can't be optimistic or pessimistic. We have to be realistic about it. We'll work for the best, but I'm worried about what their intentions are. I know that you have personally worked with Aung San Suu Kyi and over the last few years, um, she, she's become a little bit of a controversial figure on the world stage. Yeah. Can you tell us a little bit more about recent events um, in Myanmar and in the issues around the Rohingya refugees? Yeah, and that, that's what did it, I think, to the, the global community. She's always been a complicated character. Uh, people know that she's, um, she's quite strong-willed. Um, she likes to run things. She likes to control, control her party, control the government. In some ways, uh, people saw it as a, a authoritarian dem dem democratic figure, where she was so into controlling her party and even the parliamentarians that were elected uh, in, in her party. She would tell them, you can't say a word without my allowing you to say it because you're only in that position because of me. People really voted for me. So there was always that kind of uh, question about her democratic, um, uh, democratic bona fides. But then the, um, but she is open. She's definitely committed to human rights, and she is, you know, she she was never going to subvert democracy, democratic elections. But the Rohingya issue was the thing that I think created a, a different um, reputation around the world. Where she was not in control. She couldn't control the military or the police in the crime against humanity, the genocide, the atrocities that occurred towards the Rohingya, she couldn't control that. So we have to understand, and we see that even today with what happened to her, that the military always had impunity to do what they felt was necessary. And she, in trying to get in the way of that, always put her government at risk um, and the democracy at risk if she got in the way of the military prerogatives. That said, she went out and I think she spoke in ways that uh, defended the military, uh, didn't defend human rights, and the suffering that was clear by this uh, terribly um, abused uh, citizenry um, and community. So in her doing that vociferously around the world, I think people saw a different side to her, that she was the politician and not the democratic icon. Um, and I think she always, she would tell us, I'm a politician, I didn't never ask to be an icon. So we were taking her at her political face, but it does come at the expense of her reputation and for what I think is what she should be as a leader in the country and to lead on values and to define as a leader for her country, what kind of country, democratic country that she envisioned for the people. And, um, but now I think we're in a whole different realm of, uh, you know, moment for the country. So it's hard for her to really even play that role today. Right, um, especially because there have been reports that say um, that she's facing, you know, a trial in a secret court. Uh, can you talk about that? What would the charges be against her? Um, you know, what what do you think is going to happen? Yeah, it could be secret. It could be open. But the trial is not going to be. There's no rule of law there, or a just law, or independent judiciary. So it's foregone conclusion that she will be charged. She's already been charged. And this gives you a sense of, it'd be funny if it weren't so serious. Her, the first charge against her was for having illegal walkie talkies. Um, you know, that was considered walkie talkies as somehow um, uh, worthy of being brought up on charges. Now they're getting her on going out during COVID and having illegal campaign or, or mass events that put people at risk. They'll find other reasons. They're already finding her, um, her staff they're, they're drumming up charges against them for having secret documents uh, and the people around her having secret documents that they were going to use and get out of the country. Um, so there are going to be a lot of trumped up charges. And the bottom line is they're trying to sideline her permanently uh, any way possible. Um, and anyone around her use them as scapegoats. You know, it's just we know the result. Just the question is how they're going to get there. Right. 
So what we have seen, um, you know, over the last few weeks happening are increasing protests, younger people coming out to protests and the military sort of increasing force. I know there's, you know, firing live rounds, killing protesters. Um, Do you see in these protesters a generational change? Is there a difference between how the younger people are viewing this coup versus the older generation? Not how they're viewing it. No, there is a unity in this country. I mean, the, the military likes to say that they, they're the only thing standing between unity of the country and the country falling apart. They used to, in 20 years ago, talk about Yugoslavia or they talk about Indonesia and the Indonesian model of the military needing to be there to hold all these islands together. This was back 20, 25 years ago. Now Indonesia is a good model because they have a democracy and they're holding together just fine. Uh, they have other problems, but they're holding together. But this, this, this pretension that they're the thing unifying the country, what we're seeing today is unity in the country in the past month, a remarkable unity all against the military. There's a divisive, a division in the country according to ethnic, vast ethnic divisions. This is the longest running civil war running in the world, 70 years where there is no unified identity. Um, and yet people of all ethnic nationalities have come together into the street saying, we oppose the military, we want democracy. Even if we don't agree with Aung San Suu Kyi or don't agree with the NLD, this is what we want. So there is absolute unity top to bottom, old and young. What you're seeing in the young though is, and it's, it's, it's in some ways um, uh, surprising, even the activists that fought the military 30 years ago, they're seeing a creativity, an energy, a commitment, a drive that they were surprised at. Um, that is so energetic uh, and is being led by young people and not just young people, but women, young women, which is also a tremendous uh, development. We see this all over the world, frankly, this new energy for democracy among the youth and with women. So the, the, the hope of democracy is in empowering young people and empowering women and opening up its aperture because you are seeing a divide there between the older mindsets guys with guns, you know, in the military. And I would say even with Aung San Suu Kyi, an older mindset of what democracy meant, she was sort of holding back the younger voices. But uh, it's not what they want, what the goal is of older and younger, at least within society. It's the fact of the energy and the courage uh, and the creativity of using the new technologies to organize and, and to push back. And again, that gives the, that's the hope of the, of the future of Myanmar writ large. But it's also the hope of this resistance, this resilience against the old ways of the military to try to suppress it. So let's open up and talk a little bit about the the, the region. So we know that Myanmar is a neighbor to China. And so can you talk a little bit about uh, the influence or the connection China has in relation to this coup? Yeah. Well, in relation to the coup, I don't see a direct relation in the coup. The military is now trying to do that. As you mentioned, they've hired lobbyists to go out and basically tell countries what they want to hear, particularly the West and the U.S., that um, we can help you vis-a-vis China, thinking there's this great power competition, that that's why we care about Myanmar. And so they're trying to say, well, the the Aung San Suu Kyi, the NLD, they were cozying up to China. We can help you know, side with you against China. The fact is all the folks in, in Myanmar um, are not terribly crazy about China. They don't like China. They're suspicious of China. China has been, they've had experience with China as long as they've existed because they have a, what, 1300 kilometer border with China. Uh, China in imperial days would invade Burma. In more modern days, they have supported insurgent groups, communist insurgencies during the Cold War, and then more recently ethnic uh, uh, armed groups to fight against the military and to kill and to provide them weapons and, and play double games They use this, the division of the country as a lever against the central government. So nobody trusts China. Uh, I don't think they were behind the coup. I don't think it was driven by a China angle, but, uh, and I think the military is not happy about having to turn to China. In fact, that's leverage on the military because that comes at the expense of their sovereignty. And they, I think they know this. But um, for us uh, outside, for the Obama administration and for others, this is, this remains an issue of democracy and values. Um, there is, the, you know, the Biden administration talks about that, um, that there is a competition of values and norms around the world that affect our national security that involves China, but is not simply about China. 
in Myanmar, you saw the Biden administration, I mean, with the, being the first out of the gate around the world to come out and put sanctions, targeted sanctions on the military to, and, and to come out strong rhetorically uh, that this should not stand. We won't legitimize it. We need our allies to be with us. Excellent. So um, I want to talk about the U.S. in a second, but I do ha- want to bring in sort of the the issue of a democracy in the region. You know, the impact the coup has for uh, other countries in the region. And Ken has a question about neighboring Thailand being, you know, ruled by the military and an absolute monarch. Um, have the events sort of in neighboring Thailand impacted what's happening in Myanmar? It's funny. It's hard to know if there's a direct connection, but you have to be a little bit suspicious of that. And you can, and the worry that folks have is a kind of Thailand model, where you know what happened originally was Thailand said at the Thai coup in 2014, uh, the military said, "Oh, well, don't worry. It's just going to be a short time. We'll turn over to elections." And four or five years later, they finally did, um, and they did it in a way after they changed the constitution, they basically controlled the democracy that allowed the military junta leader, uh, coup leader, take off his uniform, and now he's the prime minister. This is what people worry will happen in, in Myanmar. Uh, it's hard to know if, it, if that's exactly what they're looking to do. That's a suspicion. Whether they got encouragement from the Thais, we don't know. We know the commander in chief has had a historical connection to Tha- the Thailand and to some of the senior leaders and advisors in Thailand. But you know, when the coup happened, I was still ambassador in Myanmar. And that question used to be asked of me when that happened, is that a problem for the democratic transition in Myanmar that there's a coup now, now the military is running Thailand. Um, And it seemed a role reversal. What we were seeing in Thailand at that time was exactly what we were emerging out of in Myanmar. And and what Myanmar was was saying was what Thailand used to say about democracy. They just switched places entirely. My answer in those days was, it's like a bar moving in next to an alcoholic or, or a recovering alcoholic where, you know, kind of Dang. the temptation is there. Yeah. You kind of go, oh, you know, I smell, I remember that. You know, yeah. and I'm always worried. And, and it does matter. The atmosphere does matter. The world's developments, all this stuff does have an impact, I think, to some degree, though the military is not terribly sophisticated. They're not, they're not really worldly. Um, I do worry that if there is that kind of atmosphere, it gives them a little bit more license in their own mind to take action. Though I'm not going to say that's what drove this, but it certainly matters uh, what happens around the world. So let's uh, turn to a few questions that I have, one from John and one from Ambassador Charles Shapiro that are that are linked. And they're both about um, asking, what leverage does the US have um, in Myanmar? Does China really hold all of the cards? What tools are in the, the toolbox of the US? I don't think China holds all the cards at all. Um, I mean, I don't think they're determinate necessarily, but it is very true that the U.S. on its own has very limited leverage. We don't have the relationships we had even five years ago, in part because of the alienation after the Rohingya tragedy. Um, but it, it's just, um, you know, we, we never had the same kind of um, uh, sort of uh, investment and such. So we need allies. And I think others do have some leverage. Uh, the Japanese have very good relationship. They have something, the Nippon Foundation, which is their sort of government foundation, is led by an individual who has very good relations with the military there. Uh, in fact, worked very closely with the military um, to the consternation of Aung San Suu Kyi as recently as December. That's what we need is somebody who has sort of relationship of trust, who can go in and have conversations, not just putting pressure, though pressure is very important. Whatever engagement has to be backed up by muscle of some kind and imposing some kind of threat of a cost. Um, but Japan has those relationships, trusted relationships. So they're very important. They're clearly you know, one of our best allies. ASEAN is very important. Singapore has good relationships. Um, Indonesian foreign minister has sought to, to take a lead on brokering some kind of uh, mediation or intervention of some kind that's, that's uh, respectful. India also is very important. So maybe you've heard of the, the Quad, US, Japan, Australia, and India. They're meeting this week. First summit meeting um, with Biden, President Biden and his counterparts. I know this will be an issue on the agenda. If they can get their act together and uh, say we will not legitimize this um, and have both in, uh, sort of a principled engagement with some cost, that can have some leverage. There are a lot of things that can be done potentially, 
but will anything be determinant in this case? That's a hard case to make. It's hard. It's, it's, this military has been through isolation. It's been through sanctions. I think it does matter. I think they don't want their reputation to be soiled. So we have to do as much as possible uh, to push as much leverage as we can. And the key issue ultimately is to change the military's calculation. Ultimately, this will only be decided by the commander in chief with whatever internal trusted um, group that he has internally. They're clearly in my mind, differing views within the military, but it all comes down to the commander in chief and whatever group he, he listens to. Um, and we have to find a way to get to him and make the case uh, that what he is doing is not going to work to his, his interest. Um, his interest being his family's well-being, money, uh, prestige, reputation, um, and national sovereignty of the country. And unless you can get and convince him on those things um, by talking to him, um, it's going to be very hard to see what will make a difference. So I do have a question that I want to ask um, from someone from Myanmar who's living in the diaspora who has wants to know if you have any suggestions on how um, they can support the movement at the grassroots level, um, especially from outside um, Burma. Is there anything that um, you would suggest that could help empower those that are working against the coup? Well, I think keeping, and it's a great question, it's good to hear from you wherever you are. And, and um, I know what that feels like to be on the outside, to be very personally, frankly, very. my wife and I are very personally connected to the issue and, and feel at a loss in, in quite gr in grieving mode. I think uh, just keeping a light shining on what's going on there, keep the pressure on governments, uh, keep the information flow going. Uh, there are ways of getting money in uh, through, I don't have anything to say here about that, but there are vehicles to ensure that those who may be sacrificing, who are part of the civil disobedience movement, which is going on, maybe people have heard about this, where government officials and elites have just walked off the job and said, we will not take orders from this military. They are not legitimate and we won't contribute to the system. That's important, I think. Um, also, I think talking through, I mean, the CDM is an inchoate kind of leaderless movement. There are leaders, certainly. Maybe having, if, if you have contacts, to help them think through strategy, because it, it's very much emotion is driving things now. But people are going to suffer on the ground as the they don't get the money or they don't have the jobs. Uh, it can't be just uh, indefinite, um, you know, um, remittances getting getting in. Um, people need access to their bank accounts. Uh, they need access to funding. Helping them think through some of this, the implications of the strategy that they're pursuing may be also very helpful on a very practical level. But um, I think they need to know we're watching and we're with them. So we have to just stand in solidarity and know that they're not alone and they're not forgotten. Thank you. I have a question from Caroline that if um, if there is the potential of democracy being restored, is there a way to move forward that will subdue the military's influence? Um, you know, do you uh, foresee, is there the possibility of over overhauling the leadership um, so a coup, you know, isn't a, a, recurring, um, a, a recurring possibility? Yeah, it's very hard, regardless of what's in place. And in, in the constitution that they themselves wrote in 2008, um, to many people, this coup is illegal. And they talk about rule of law. The weird thing about this military is they will say that, uh, you know, they, they, they seem to be a rogue element, but they always talk about, you know, fealty to the Constitution, always harken back to a Constitution. But regardless, whatever you put in there, they're going to find a reason why what they did was legal or why it's defensible. And uh, the key is over time, you know, I think there has to be a different mindset um, and different generations in that military to recognize that their interventions are costly to the country. If they truly care, and I do believe many people, again, within the leadership there and within the different levels of the military, they get this was not smart. They, 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 they just can't speak up. Um, we have to remember in November last year, there was an election and many of the military dominated districts of the country went for Aung San Suu Kyi and her party. So the, there is definitely a support within the military um, for the NLD and against this coup, but you have to change the way they think um, and you have to get men online, this commander in chief, probably to retire somehow and get to a new generation of people. But otherwise guys with guns who have a tradition 
of stepping in for democracy, who teach, who train their people in the military to believe that they are the guarantors of national unity, of national stability, of national sovereignty, and that they have to do this for the country. Um, that they're, they're the parents and these are the children they have to guide. They just drum that in to people, to their people. You know, it's very hard to put anything in place that will prevent these guys with guns from doing what they did again and again, unfortunately. So I, we only have time for, you know, one last question. And I have to say that you spoke so, so eloquently and so powerfully about the impact that young women and, and just women in general are having in these movements around the world. Yeah. But as you know, as the president of the National Democratic Institute, and as you look at the world um, this year in particular, we have been hearing reports that democracy is increasing, increasingly under threat around the world. And in fact, even here at home in the US. Yep. Uh, so broadly speaking, do you think that democracy is in retreat? What is our greatest hope? It is certainly regressed. Um, it is in retreat in, in terms of how you measure democracy. Freedom House comes out every year with a, um, a measurement and they've now measured declines in global democracy for 15 years straight. This is not just the last four years, it's 15 years straight. Uh, something called VDEM, which is based out of uh, Stockholm, I think, or in, in the, uh, uh, around, I think it's Stockholm. They measure this in very precise ways. They're seeing regression, the, ec the economist intelligence units. There's no doubt about it. But you also see resilience. You're, you're, you're seeing, um, as I mentioned, young people, women, you're seeing uh, civil society, you're seeing um, lots of people who are seeing the regression in cities. There's an urban rural divide. Um, fear is being used, division is being used. Uh, the other, we're seeing that in our country, the populist uh, narratives, that's not just the US, we're seeing this all over where people are um, trying to uh, sort of keep democracy in form but degrading it in fact um, and using fear, which to me is the enemy of democracy to degrade democracy and democratic institutions. So this is a challenge. What we have to recognize is this is not easy. Democracy has to be defended. It has to be struggled for, that um, it is up to us to do it. Uh, and, so, and a lot of these people that have taken over who are not small D Democrats, they were elected to those positions uh, and then are supported by people who feel like democracy is not delivering for them. Democracy has to deliver for people. And we see that in our own country. NDI doesn't work in the United States, but the great, the genius of, democ of, of democracy in elections is that it gives a pulse every, it could be two years, it could be four years, whenever it is, um, that tells you something is going on in the country you need to be aware of, Washington. You gotta get out of your bubble. And you've gotta address these problems, otherwise you'll see a, a reaction. And uh, we need to figure out how to listen to that, uh, empower everyone so that everyone's voices is, are heard, and then fight for this democracy, fight for it. Because we've talked a little bit about China, but China, Russia, the illiberal tide is out there. They are out there shaping a world safe for autocracy. They know what will, will defend and protect them and the elites. Um, and what we need to do, what NDI does uh, around the world, we have 55, now I think we have 57 offices around the world. We've been around 40 years uh, and we've been working side by side with these small D Democrats to be resilient against this tide. And some of the folks we worked with, they have turned out to I mean, like Viktor Orban was one of our, you know, one of our results of our work uh, and they can turn bad. They can turn to the dark side, you know, yeah. but it's not about individuals. It's not about one person. It's not about Aung San Suu Kyi or Viktor Orban or, or even Nelson Mandela. Democracies are about systems. They're about processes and about a culture. They're about institutional development, but about a culture of compromise, about civics and about, about working together uh, and, and cooperation in communication. And that's hard. It is hard. It's not something that can be done quickly and it can degrade over time if you're not careful, if you're complacent. So, you know, either we bemoan the fact that we're regressing around the world or we roll up our sleeves and we say, we're going to fight back. And we're seeing that in Burma. I mean, people thought, let me end on this. Uh, there's a lot more to say on this. I can go on and on, but, but uh, there are poll numbers in Burma. Um, that said the young people are getting apathetic about politics and that they do, people were saying, ah, we really don't really care about democracy. We've heard that right around the world. We, we hear that about our own people. And yet the moment it was taken from them, 
they said, oh, hold on. No, no, no. We want this. This is like oxygen. When you take it away from us, we know when it's gone and we want this and we demand this. And as bad as democracy may be in practice or it's not delivering for us, this is essential. It's a fact it's a weak democracy. That's the problem, not democracy itself. And so that resilience remains there. And we now need to be partnering with the world and networking in, in solidarity with everyone to support each other in this democratic fight that will never end. History never ends. Um, that's the complacent side of the post-Cold War moment. We have to fight for this and work on this as long as we democracies exist. Ambassador Mitchell, thank you so much for joining us on State of the World today. We have a lot of questions, so I know that um, that this conversation will continue, and I very much look forward to welcoming you here in Hartford in person at some point soon. I can't wait. I got to get back to Hartford. Uh, but thank you for the opportunity, uh, Megan. Thank you, Amanda. Thank you to everyone for joining us. Um, to close out this portion, a huge thank you to UConn Global for making this event possible and for all of their support. Uh, this discussion is an event of the Council's State of the World series. Uh, so coming up, we'll tackle everything from global movements for civil rights uh, to China's new digital currency, and from crises of the Horn of Africa to the argument that this period might just be the storm before the calm. Uh, so we invite you to join us next week when we'll partner with our friends at the Ireland Connecticut Business Council to celebrate St. Patrick's Day with the Embassy of Ireland in the U.S. Uh, so it's going to be a little a bit of a special episode. We hope you can join us. It's going to be a fantastic one. And to make sure you don't miss an episode, visit our website at ctwac.org. Uh, subscribe to our YouTube channel at World Affairs Council of Connecticut. And uh, make sure that you subscribe to the State of the World podcast where you'll see this episode, past episodes, future episodes, um, and you can find that wherever you get your podcasts. And once again, Ambassador Mitchell, uh, how generous of you to give us your <laughs> afternoon. So thank you so much. It was fantastic speaking with you. Thank you. This is a labor of love, as you can tell. So mm -hmm. thank you for the opportunity. And this conference has given some of the best talks I heard. Genuine openness and willingness to have conversations. Engaged and alive and thriving. A wonderful platform for us to share and learn. An opportunity to meet colleagues from Arab countries who I'd never had the chance to meet. When sort of like-minded people are coming together from very different disciplines, um, then I, I do think miracles can take place. I've had the chance to exchange with them and I'll remember that and I carry that and I'm grateful for that. Thank you.